uh, last night was the first night of the Passover Seder, which my family has celebrated since I was a little boy. The word tradition really comes into play because we were not exactly a religious family, but there were certain things that were passed down generation to generation. And they have a certain kind of codified vitality. They mean something, they have history, they have longevity. They don't really mean a lot to me, honestly, in terms of the mythologies of what's going on. Uh, the stories are in some ways relevant, in some ways for me irrelevant. But last night was very extraordinary for a number of reasons. The first was that my 10 year old granddaughter Talia conducted the entire Passover Seder. She wanted to do it and she did it with incredible aplomb. She was brilliant, uh, inspiring. I hadn't seen her in two weeks and when I saw her, I just saw a radiance and a beauty that I had never seen really manifesting like that before. It was always there internally, but it just was showing itself so incredibly well. I had such pride and joy and, and familial um, awe in a sense. And it was a beautiful evening until <laughs> you come to the story of Passover, which is pages long. And for years and years, often people would come to me to tell the story, or I would choose to tell the story because one, I'm a storyteller, two, it's, it's, uh, it's a good story. And I have a knack as a filmmaker to kind of get it done quickly and directly and get the emotional beats in it. And last night, Joshua, my son, said to me, Dad, why don't you just tell the story of Passover? I said, OK. And then I sat there, and I had no idea what the story of Passover was. <laughs> Completely, absolutely gone. Like much of my brain, like much of my personal story, so much of what I have always taken for granted is part of my makeup in a way, just not there. And on one level, it was disturbing, really for Joshua more than anybody, because I think he just looked and said, oh my God, <laughs> this is the beginning of taking care of elderly parents without brains or minds, which is probably true. But for me, it was shocking not to have access to something that has always, always been part of the background story. And, and it's a good story and it has, it has lots of uh, metaphysical aspect to it about freedom from slavery on every level. But I couldn't even remember that Moses was part of it. So that's where my brain was. And I tell you all that for a number of reasons. One of them is I am losing my connection to story my connection to the mythos or the mythologies of our lives, and a word that I've been using a lot recently, which is the dogma, the teachings that have formed us as people, which seem foundational on some level and which are foundational, but I suddenly am losing touch with that. Does that mean dementia? Uh, possible, you know, I don't, I really don't know. Spiritually speaking, it doesn't feel like dementia exactly. It feels like stuff falling away and underlying truths revealing themselves without recourse to story and past tense history. It's just, there is a phenomenal 
truth in the what is of every moment. And there is a falling away of all the things that have defined you up to now. I haven't been there before. So I report from the field that this is going on. It may disqualify me at some point for, for being a teacher. And I guess the way we'll know that is when I sit down here to a Zoom class or we have classes in person and nobody shows up. I completely will understand that and respect that. I will say for the moment, um, I sense an underlying reality and truth being spoken that has very little to do with Bruce or the story of Bruce or anything other than this being that underlies and precedes the story. And in every case, that being exists in all of us. This being that is there before we start to take our first breath, before we start to define ourselves according to the parents we have and the siblings we have and the aunts and uncles and the, and the condition we find ourselves in, both physiological and biological, all of these things which start to define us in some ways that we react to and build a story around all of that is actually a being relating to all of that. And something popped up on my screen and I'm going to get rid of it if I can. Good. And uh, I have to tell you that being is who and what we are. And that all the stuff that surrounds it, the story that evolves over the course of however many years we're given, is something we relate to as a uh, real, solid, permanent aspect of our being. But it is not permanent. As we all know, anyone who is a Buddhist knows that the key element of all this is impermanence. It doesn't last, it will all go away. And if you're like me, it's starting to happen while I'm still sitting there and I'm watching it fall away and going, oh, wow. I didn't know the story of Passover and a year ago I told the whole story. So this is a year. I know it's a year of a lot of strange stuff going on for me, you know, as you know, medically, and I don't particularly need to reference all that, but this is a year of something else happening. It is in my story of my family. My grandpa Abe, <laughs> this is when we discovered what was going on with dementia, he went out to dinner with a girlfriend, a new girlfriend. He hadn't really taken her out before. And while they were at dinner, he got up to go to the bathroom. When he got out of the bathroom, he went and got in his car and drove home. And she was left sitting at that table never knowing quite what happened. And the story in the family is that he was so embarrassed that he decided to make it up to her, took her out to dinner a second time and left her again, sitting in the restaurant. That's when we all knew this was not the grandpa we had known and that things were falling away and in trouble. My forgetting the story of Passover may have been that defining moment. And if it is, uh, you all are witnesses to the idea anyway, that maybe we should stop listening to Bruce. However, I am, I am going to try to keep doing this as long as something feeling like that which precedes the story comes through. And so here's the underlying thing, which I know I have repeated now for quite a while since that operation in August and the pain episode that I went through, which now continues in a very different way. I, I'm not in pain as I was at that point, but I'm definitely living in a new bodily environment that's full of headaches and unending discomforts, not pain, but just like, yikes, this is awful on some level, but what's occurring are two different things. And I think they're really important. One of them is I'm just accepting it. I have never known my capacity at this 
level to just accept this ongoing weirdness and discomfort that is environmental bodily stuff that is just not endurable if you sit there and analyze it and react to it. But if you don't react to it, it just becomes the what is, the new norm. And that new norm for me is, it doesn't feel good, it's constant, it doesn't really go away, but I can live with it. I Not only can I live with it, the secret of all of this, and again, if this generalizes to any of you, that will be wonderful because I can only tell you it is wonderful. The secret is underneath this bizarre discomfort of being and losing your mind and all of this stuff, I have never felt more joy, more gratitude or more love in my life than I am feeling now and of course, it goes very directly to Blanche, which I think I say every week, but it also goes to you, to each of you. And I have somehow, in the process of the last 50 years, there's a story involved called Meeting Rudy and learning about uh, teachings that come from India and come from Tibet and come from my own Jewish heritage. There's so many stories. And, and for me also, as a a good Jew in a way, although I'm not, but, but having Christ arise out of all that. And, and I have gotten enormous, enormous value from the Christ teachings. And you put all of this together and underlying it is this unbelievable joy of being and a communicable, a communicable ability to share it. And, and the way it's shared is I sit with each of you, even when I'm not with you, you should know it's still working. But when I sit with you, look at you, feel my way toward you, this quality of being, this joy permeates. It goes, it's transmitted into you. And that is something Rudy shared with us. He taught how to transmit energy, how to share this capacity. And I have evolved, even minus my story, my name, my history, and my ability to remember Passover, I look at each of you and something comes back to me. And it says, this is the strong element. This is the weak element. This is where there's a great deal of development. This is where there's a lack of development. Every one of you is, when I look at you, uh, in, in a spiritual depth, if you will, an energetic depth, I see what is still to be worked on, what is missing. And the energy that comes through me, which is mostly love and consciousness, goes into you and it finds its way into the belly of the beast, if you will, the thing that's not really working properly, that's not in alignment with all the other stuff that's in you that's really highly developed. And it just goes there and it starts to percolate and it starts to awaken parts of you that will make you more whole. I don't know how I do that, but it is a diagnostic tool that was transmitted to me, I think through Rudy, which functions as far as I can tell with enormous awareness and clarity and it is there completely in service of you, you specifically, and it knows what to do or so it appears. And I will keep doing this thing as long as there is a sense of inner directive, being told to do it, which I am. I am instructed what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and I show up. This is the first time I've ever shown up without remembering what Passover is. So if that's the case, the next time I show up, I don't know what exactly I'll be bringing to the table and you guys will have to be the measure of that. You'll have to say, this guy's lost it. He left me at the restaurant. <laughs> you know, he's no longer, he's no longer part of, the, of what I need here. And I am really deeply available to be told that because I don't want to, I don't want this to be pretend 
I don't want this to be in service of some past history or identity. I don't have any real personal walking around day-to-day -day sense of being a teacher or a transmitter or a knower of anything. And I will tell you, I think I've said it now week after week, my skill set now involves not knowing. I, every mythology that we have been given over the course of our life is starting to just evaporate for me. And what's coming through is probably the thing that created mythologies in the first place. Because I think at the core of all of us is an unbelievably profound awareness and knowing that is there before we're born, probably, certainly there as we're born. And then it starts to develop the story of our life that gets in the way of everything. And then if we can smooth it out and relax and surrender and go deep and meditate, we get past our own story back to that incredible awareness of our pure being. And when I walk around, you know, spring is here, guys, and rebirth is here, the renewal of everything. And I'm feeling it with such power and, and, and joy and gratitude. And I walk, I don't reference, I don't, I don't even know where I am, to be honest. I'm walking on these streets that I've only lived at for a year and still don't know fully how it is I got here. But I'm going, God knows this is beautiful. This is beautiful. And I'm just going, thank you, thank you. And we're finding all of these neighbors along the way that we've started to know. We've, you know, because of the pandemic, we've never even been in our houses, but we, we stop and talk on the street and it's really rich and fulfilling. And there's a kind of level of being that does not involve who you were, what your story is, what your past tense is. It's just who you are at this moment. And you don't even know how much of what you are is falling away until you're told to tell the story of Passover and can't remember it. You go, oh my God. But walking down the street, I didn't know that was gone. I didn't know that had disappeared. I didn't feel any sense of loss. I just felt full. I felt full of being and full of this quality of love that seems to be the nest in which that quality of being resides. So I share all this as a person on a journey that we seem to share in that journey because you know, we all come from a particular teaching and teacher, which I think is a rare blessing in life, finding a teacher who promotes so much insight and so much energetic awakening and change and transformation is a gift beyond, beyond measure, as far as I can tell, because I see a lot of people who don't have that. On the other hand, the universe is deeply kind and compassionate, and I think it works for people who you know, in the traditional sense, follow the Ten Commandments, who live good lives, who don't mess up. And if you do mess up, I think there is a lot of potential for retribution, but that's a big journey. The retribution journey takes time and maybe lifetimes. I can't address that knowingly. But I do know that in this lifetime, every second you have an opportunity to be kind and loving and good to another human being or to yourself, take that opportunity every single time. And whatever retribution is required in your life for God knows what past sins may have been committed, it will all happen in the present tense. Be loving and good and kind to one another as a constant. Be in front of it. Be kind beforehand. You know, if you can, if you know you're if you have a partner and you know your partner is going to have to do something in 10 minutes, do it first. Take care of it. Do it for them. Find a way to be out ahead of everything by thinking and being aware. And you don't have to cognate it. It's just this thing that arises that cares so deeply about you and the other. And I have never, ever witnessed that so dramatically as I am doing now. And the uh, moment to moment joy of, for me, partnership. And I can see because of the truth of, Im of impermanence that I may at some point I'll be around without a partner, which is unbearable to think of. But if that were to happen to me, that I think this practice will continue 
by loving myself and caring for myself in really honest and real and deep ways. But right now I have other, and that other is a gift. But if you don't have another at this point in time, use yourself as the, the, the other that needs attention, that needs care, that needs true appreciation and love and live with that. And you will go to this place in yourself where you discover the other in you is eternal, infinite being. That's what you truly are, who you truly are. And when you start to love other, you're really loving the oceanic. You're loving the massive part of being. And when you don't have a significant other, you're the other. And you're always the other. And if you can find that other, if you can go from ego self to self, and love being and hear the being and let it direct you, let it inform you. And I'm telling you, again, I'm not trying to create dogma here and I'm not trying to tell you how it works. I'm telling you what is happening to me. This inner directive is so caring about every step I take, literally every step I take. It takes care for me walking down the stairs. I have a lot of stairs in this house. It is very aware that at any moment, one of my legs may give out. That kind of thing happens at a certain point. It wants me holding on. It wants me available to caring for myself. And it is directive of that. It not only cares about the stairs, it cares about everything, everything. And the amount of love that comes at us in this universe is enormous. The fact that it's sometimes cloaked in pain and in forgetting and in discomfort doesn't change the fact that there is love in the equation or as Rudy would put it so dynamically, pain is God's love. It's so hard to understand that until you feel it. I do not understand how one lives in this level of unshakable discomfort, <laughs> you know, this headache and I, I was I went to five doctors this week. None of them had a clue. None of them had a clue to what was going on. Eh, nothing. <laughs> and I'm going, oh my, you know, I, there's, I, there's no way to describe the discomfort. And you realize in the end, you're in this alone, everybody. We're in this alone. Those doctors, some, you may like find somebody who's got a clue to something, but mostly it's up to us and it's up to this deeper being. And we have to find, we have to find a surrender to that phenomenal deep thing that cares for us and loves us even as it dismantles us, takes us apart and puts us through levels of discomfort that we have not really prepared for but have always been told will be there. They are, they are, they are coming, but they come in different ways for each person. Some people really smush, smush very quickly and painfully, sometimes slowly and you know, rheumatologically <laughs> they come at you. Whatever it is, this ultimate uh, impermanence of our body and our mind and our being is arriving. It will arrive. And for some of you, you may not need to listen to this talk for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, whatever. But at some point along the way, this thing will come and you will have, God willing, an ability to go, okay. Even this, I, I will tell you again for the maybe <laughs> hundredth time here, underneath it, the quality of love is shocking, shocking. It is so overwhelmingly wonderful, full of wonder and beauty that you can handle just about anything. And when you can't handle it, we'll figure that one out at that moment. That's, that's the thing that comes. But somehow or another, I think we are taken to transition points and there comes a point where you go, okay, this is not for me to do. We just find our way. We find our way through this remarkable experience of being alive, this remarkable experience of being in the world, this opportunity to see the beauty and the madness and the consistency and the inconsistency and the endless changeability of reality, of matter. 
We see reality right now breaking up into fake reality, you know, fake truth. We're seeing, we're seeing so much stuff evolving and devolving around us. But when you go deep inside, nothing and nobody, no teaching, no dogma, nothing can touch this ultimate truth that's in you. So finding that seems to be the worthwhile pursuit of a lifetime. And everyone who's listening to this now is on that journey. Everyone, every one of you is doing this. And I can only tell you, it works, at least up until now. You know, I don't know what tomorrow is. You know, I, I may forget all of you. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> that would be the, you know, I'll sit here with people I don't even know, but I have a feeling I will be deeply in love with you no matter what. And I really, really am in love with you. And I really do care about you. And I can only I can only share so much knowledge, which appears to be falling away. So we'll, we'll see. Week by week, we'll figure it out. But I will tell you, at this very moment, the core truth of everything I'm saying is that love exists. I know nothingness exists. But I also have experienced and described to you that the first thing that arises out of nothingness is love. The very first thing. I don't know how or why, but we also will also have to learn to deal with nothingness. And I have been there now enough in the last nine months or so to know that there's a journey where everything's taken away, including all the love. It's taken away. And when it's taken away, if you want to figure out how to grow spiritually, that's where it happens. You really start to grow when nothing is nothing is helping you. Nothing is supporting you. Just hang in there because rebirth is on the way. Spring is on the way. Most of us that's here right now. And be grateful and celebrate rebirth. It's a part of the constant of the human dynamic, of the human journey, and probably goes on beyond life and death. That's my guess. So I'm getting long-winded. Getting, I am long-winded. Um, I'm going to bring this to a close. If anybody here wants a question answered, I can uh, I can try to do that. You'll have to unmute yourself and raise your hand. Then, so uh, firstly, just I just would wanted to share that a uh, uh, kind of an analogous to your explanation of what you've been your your process has been sort of reminded me a little bit of the history of modern art in the 20th century, which is like, you know, starting, you know, originally starting in the 19th century and far beyond as like this uh, ongoing symbolism, religious symbolism often, but mythology is like uh, playing out again and again. And then finally coming to the, just like the pure perception and examining perception with impressionism and then into abstraction, abstract expressionism or like field paintings. And so it seems like um, obviously uh, there can be that vast expansive prof profundity and beauty without any of the story. So I just wanted to share that. Really and, <laughs> uh, but that's my, you know, my conditioning as an artist to make those connect connections. Um, but I was kind of interested to ask you, um, you know, you mentioned these directives from, from, from the ones upstairs, so to speak, that you get and uh, I guess I was wondering if you have, if you still feel like a particular at times, like a presence or um, connection with, with, uh, with Rudy or Rudy in particular, his energy or Nichinanda or Padmasambhava or anything like that, or it's kind of dissolved past those lineage connections for you. Well, you know, Rudy's picture is everywhere in my house. Nitin mm -hmm. picture is everywhere in my house. So I, mm -hmm. I do have a connection to the lineage but it doesn't feel in any way limited to that. It feels so much more expansive. And, and I, I can't name it. It just doesn't have a name. It doesn't have form. It doesn't have content that I understand. And it certainly isn't processed by my brain at this point. It just is a known truth. And you feel it as truth. I don't know how to say it in, in any other way. It, it so makes itself known. And it makes itself known as something that really, really cares about you. <laughs> you know, in the way that I care about my 
grandchildren and my children and even you, Dan, you know, the thing, the thing that really cares about you, I don't know what that is, but it's not exactly Bruce. You know, it, I mean, Bruce definitely is a filter through which it moves, but it is so, it so precedes Bruce. It's so much bigger. And for me to give it a name or to limit it to anything in the mythological didactic sort of universe that we have found ourselves in would not do it justice. It just wouldn't. It would just be a short changing something much bigger. And for me to label it doesn't help. So I just don't label it anymore. I just know it's there. I like the word truth. I like the word love. And I, even those are not fully defining of it. And it is malleable. It, it, I have to say, and there are times where it feels other, sometimes punishing even. And then I have to go, well, that's, what do I do with that? How, what's the reaction to that? And the teaching for me, which I've expressed a lot recently, is non-reaction, trying just to let go of reaction, because reaction defines the boundaries of an ego mind for me. Letting go of that, it just is. And I go, okay. And then something happens in the letting go of it that is worth learning to do. And ultimately, I think the spiritual, I hate that word, but the word is ultimately the journey of being. You know, you just stop reacting to the positive and the negative, the beauty, not, not reacting, but just not holding it, not grabbing it, not thinking, now I got it, because that's not true. <laughs> There's, it's death and rebirth. It comes and goes. Everything comes and goes. And there may be a space underneath that nothing comes and goes. And I've felt that on occasion, that, that permanent, whatever you want to call that, knowing wisdom, but I can't label it at all. I think the, 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 uh, the Tibetan term, I think, would be dharmakaya. If you look into that, the, you'd find an affinity, I think. Like, well, I honestly, I honestly look to you to give me those terms because I don't have them. And, I don't, and, I, and, and it's always interesting to me that maybe that those terms exist. And that, I mean, I'm not surprised that they do. I'm not tutored in that way, but I am living this real life of something going on and sharing it for some reason. And I think for people who can pick up on that and use it, great. If you don't pick up on it and use it, then, I, then it's just more storytelling. And, you know, that's okay. It's an interesting story. But the reality for me is something fundamental and foundational, vast and beyond comprehension is happening. And I am just another person in this massive unfolding. And I am not, and never have been very special to it. I'm just another guy, person. And it's happening to me. I don't understand it, but it means that it can, does, and will happen to everybody else. So by talking about it and demarking it in a way, it just helps the rest of us go, hmm, okay, you know, we'll see. You can try to encourage it. And, I, and I've tried to teach this. You encourage it by happening, by getting out of the way or turning yourself inward because the real seems to be inside and the manifestation of reality, which is outside, is the thing that really, really is impermanent. It's changing by every second. This just keeps changing. But as you go inside into the oceanic part of all this, it's not quite, it may be changeable, but it doesn't change at the same rapidity of the outside. And learning how to be part of that inner space that has duration and, and, and vastness, it's, it's a remarkable place to, to settle or to feel. And then you go through this part of your life that I'm going through, which is, you know, everything falling away and it's not falling anywhere. If anything, it's getting louder and bigger and noisier and noise is a wrong factor because it seems like noise is, is, is unpleasant. It's not unpleasant. It's just the opposite. It is like, it can't be more beautiful. It just can't. I mean, maybe, maybe it gets more beautiful, but I don't know how one withstands that. But I, I feel that at times I just go, how do I handle more beauty? How do I handle more truth? How do I handle more joy? I don't know. I don't know. I have no clue. But it doesn't seem to be stopping. So figure it out. Any Anybody else? Right. George. I was just thinking that perhaps using 
the memory of Passover is just part of losing the propaganda of our duality uh, of who we are. And, and it's just, we're going to all go there. <laughs> so I think we worry about it. <laughs> I don't think everybody goes there, but I do know I am going there. And I'm surprised by it last night. You don't know you're going there until somebody asks you to say something that you've always said and thought it was there and then realizing, oh my God, it's not. Otherwise you think everything is in place and then you go, well, that's not in place. What else isn't in place? I, I have no idea, but I don't walk around with a sense of loss. I walk around with whatever it is and it feels full and complete and, and fine. It feels fine. And uh, the story of Passover is the dogma of 2,000, 3,000 years it's true. Of, of our commonality. Right. In who you are now, but it's not really who you are. I mean, that's well, I will tell you the great power of this for me was that my 10 year old granddaughter is carrying it on as a tradition. I'm not necessary in this anymore. She was doing it. Why she was doing it at 10 years old, I don't know. But <laughs> she was so good at it and so masterful that I just walked away with like good hands. We're in good hands. It'll be taken care of, if assuming it's important. So. It's kind of beautiful. The, the whole ride is beautiful. I, I can't tell you anything else. It's just, it's really beautiful. I know we suffer. I know there's enormous pain and suffering in the world. I can barely handle it. Um, I can't, I, you know, I'm supposed to watch all these Academy movies to vote and I cannot handle another sad, sad story. I just can't, it's too difficult. Uh, so I've stopped, although I did watch all the Academy um, uh, animated films the other day with Blanche. I, they were brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> if you get to see the Academy, the animated films, they are talking to pieces of the human experience like nothing I've ever seen. And I really, <laughs> really was awed by them. But that's it. I think, I, I think I'm done. I don't think I can watch another horrible story of human suffering. I know human suffering goes on. I know all of us have touched it and maybe are touching it in a big way. But, but I do know, I don't know what to do with it. It hits me too deeply now. It's too profound. I, I have no separation from it. So I just go, okay, I know it's there. I know it's there for all of us. And, uh, and I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm, I, saw, I saw a few films that I liked. I will vote for those. They're all about uplift and possibility of the human species, and I'm grateful for those. And uh, and we're all on a we're all on a journey to uplift. And I will tell you, uh, I think I will end it with this: the deepest, most powerful part of this inner oceanic reality is its uplift. It lifts us up to who we can be. You know, every time Josh Groban sings that song, you lift me up, <laughs> I just cry. You know, I just, it's, it's such a corny song, but I just cry. Because I really feel, I feel this uplift. And we're all, we're all being lifted up to the degree that we don't hold on to the density of our past. The past is gone. It's gone. If you don't, if you don't idolize and fantasize about the past, this uplift carries you. So anyway, keep keep riding. Love you guys. Uh, next week is uh, California. We'll be back here in two weeks. I'm looking forward sometime in the next month or two to kind of getting us back together in the actual sitting around together in here. And uh, if we can pull that off, I, I would really, really love that. And. Uh, just giving everybody a hug would make me feel incredibly wonderful. So take care of yourselves, love yourselves, uh, be good, and uh, we'll see you, see you here in two weeks. <laughs>